situation that we're in. So I want to encourage people to do that. I want to encourage people who are the leaders in their homes and their jobs uh, to let somebody else take over for a few hours or a day so that you can uh, rest up and recharge. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you can help uh, everyone, to help someone. Uh, and uh, along those lines, um, I want to talk to you about the first thing that we'll talk about tonight. Uh, and that is uh, yesterday, after receiving word from the state that they could not currently fill uh, my star request to replenish uh, food at our food banks, I asked my team to create a virtual food drive. Um, that is, should be up on the screen here. Uh, there we go. So if, uh, Philip, if you would, I just leave the North Texas Food Bank up there, and then I'm going to have you punch and, uh, you know, sorry, man, I'm going to get you to give them some money. Um, and I'll pay you back. Um, all right, so um, here's the thing. As you can imagine, um, there are a lot of people who, for the first time in their lives, are experiencing hunger. And um, our food banks right now are running very, very short. And that's why I asked the, uh, for, for the state's help in replenishing those food banks. Um, but at this time, that state help won't be arriving, so we all need to step up. And I'm going to personally step up myself um, and, and uh, uh, give to this effort. Uh, this effort is going to be called Neighbors Helping Neighbors, and it's a virtual food drive benefiting the North Texas Food Bank, but really benefiting us all. So the North Texas Food Bank has increased demand, not just here in Dallas County, but in all 13 of the counties uh, that they serve. And with thousands of people facing furloughs and layoffs, uh, the longer they're at home, the more that demand is going to increase, and it's already increased to an all-time high. And for many, as I've said before, it's the first time they found themselves in this uh, situation. Um, and so um, what we're doing is we're creating 25 uh, pound family food boxes to distribute to North Texas families. Uh, and these include, uh, you know, canned items as well as uh, fresh items. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, again, uh, the North Texas Food Bank and I need your help, all right? And, and by visiting uh, our website here, which has suddenly disappeared, unfortunately. Philip, can you get the website to yeah, come back on? Um, by visiting DallasCountyCovid.org, um, you can click on that uh, North Texas Food Bank icon. It's right there on that. And it will take you to a donate page where you can donate 25, 50, 100, whatever dollars uh, you choose uh, to help feed hungry families. Uh, this will uh, help us because we are running out of food for these hungry families. Don't go to the grocery store and buy what you think they need. Please give online and let us buy at bulk rates uh, what we know they need. Um, so again, uh, that is DallasCountyCovid.org. Can you click on that and show them how easy it is, Philip? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, right now. Awesome. So we clicked on it. And you just, there it is. And you, uh, it's easy to give. And we, and uh, that's the uh, first thing I want to talk to you about. I want to ask you to please do that because there are families that are running out of food. Um, further, um, let's see, further on that, um, uh, I want to again ask uh, Governor Abbott and the state to load the additional benefits passed by Congress last week onto the Lone Star cards, okay? Millions of Texans uh, get groceries through the Lone Star card cards. That's what um, where you get your SNAP, which is the Supplemental, um, what is that? Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program benefits, um, and your WIC benefits, your Women, Infant, Children benefits. It loads onto that card, and you take it like a credit card uh, to the grocery store. Uh, right now, Texas is the only state uh, that has not successfully loaded that um, onto the cards. That will help us um, if, if we can't get help on replenishing our food banks. Um, at, at a minimum, uh, do what every other state has done. Let's get those cards loaded up. Uh, that will help 
uh, because the Congress is required by law, and uh, there's extra money for these families at a time. When so many kids are staying home from school, there's more need for food there. So many people are out of, of work. Uh, so please, uh, we hope to get that done uh, very, very soon. Um, and uh, I guess that is it on food. Um, we had 97 uh, cases today and no death. Um, what we're seeing is a, basically a flat number over the last four days, and that is a very good thing, but it is too early to tell uh, what the future holds. Uh, and so I caution against being overly optimistic, just as I caution against people being um, you know, overly pessimistic. Let's, uh, for you, uh, we, we have a different situation uh, on my team, but for you, just take it one day um, at a time. And with that, I want to um, uh, turn it over to Dr. Phil Wong. We do have, um, you know, some uh, concerning things happening in um, congregate setting homes. Uh, so, uh, we now have an outbreak in a psychiatric hospital. We have uh, new, host new uh, nursing homes that have outbreaks. Um, and the nursing homes that we had, uh, they uh, um, unfortunately uh, have grown, the outbreaks there have grown. So I'm going to let Phil deal with that, and uh, I know there's, uh, I'll deal with one other thing after Phil about some, uh, you know, crazy letter that we got. So, Phil. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, for our update today, uh, we're reporting a new 97 cases. Uh, of coronavirus uh, 19, COVID-19, uh, bringing our total case count in Dallas County now to 1,112. Um, there are no additional deaths reported today. Uh, in the jail setting, we still have 24 cases, um, including 22 inmates and two detention officers. Um, as, as the judge mentioned, uh, we have uh, been reporting long-term care facilities, uh, Monticello West, uh, have a total of four persons associated with Monticello West, Skyline Nursing Facility, a total of 30 persons associated there, Edgemere Lux Luxury Living, a total of 10 uh, persons there. And I, I forgot to mention, uh, at Monticello West, we have had one death there. Uh, at Edgemere Luxury Living, a um, total of 10 persons uh, with two, two deaths reported there. Uh, the reserve at Richardson, we have seven. Uh, persons uh, reported there. Westridge Nursing Home, one person. Um, there, Brentwood Place, one. Uh, have 17 uh, persons uh, reported there. St. Joseph Village, uh, one person. And Villages of Dallas, we have one person. Uh, so, um, and as, as the judge mentioned also, uh, the inpatient psychiatric care facility, Green Oaks, is another place uh, where there have been some uh, patients and staff. I think a total of seven uh, identified at that location. Um, one other thing, uh, the CDC has, uh, you know, with the new information, and, and we've said all along that uh, the, the situation evolves and changes every day and new information is learned about this. Uh, as it became more evident uh, that there's a significant uh, a portion of persons with coronavirus that don't have symptoms and those that uh, develop symptoms be even before they develop the symptoms, uh, that there's uh, transmission of the virus before showing of those symptoms, um, and so that also um, transmission can occur uh, between people who are interacting very in close proximity just through talking sometimes as well as coughing. Um, so CDC uh, has modified the recommendations, made new recommendations uh, just this weekend about wearing cloth face coverings uh, in public settings uh, where uh, other physical distancing is hard to maintain, where you can't uh, keep that six-foot distancing places like perhaps grocery stores, pharmacies, um, and those sort of places. Now, it's, it's really important to emphasize a couple of things about that, uh, that uh, it's still, that doesn't mean that you don't have to still maintain the physical distancing. It's still important to keep that six foot distance and it's still important to stay home. This doesn't mean now, oh, you don't have to stay home, uh, but this is just added protection when you do have to go into those uh, public uh, settings. And so, um, and also the other thing is not to be using the medical grade masks, uh, the N95s and those others that are being used that are needed in the hospital settings. But there's a lot of information about how to make these simply, whether out of 
just folding up the cloth and putting some rubber bands on. Uh, this is something that's very simple. Uh, you can put it on, and there's also things on the internet how to make them out of t-shirts. Um, but the other thing is also how to properly use these. And so, um, you know, it's important. One of the concerns is not that you could contaminate yourself if, if someone sneezed on this on the outside. So it's very important after you put it on to take it off, you know, just by the ears, and then wash it immediately. Don't, you know, make a bunch of these, wash these after they're used, and then... Um, uh, but, but that added protection when you're out in public places where it's difficult uh, for, social, uh, for uh, physical distancing is this new recommendation. So I think that's it. So, let me uh, uh, cover one other thing. We received a letter, I actually received it from a reporter, oddly enough, um, but a letter was written to me by uh, Luis Sanz, the governor's uh, chief of staff. I think all the media has a copy of that letter. It's a very odd letter um, in that it, it uh, intimates that we don't want uh, the federal resource, the hospital at the uh, convention center, when actually we are uh, working hours and hours a day uh, to stand up that uh, resource. Um, and so we can take uh, questions on that, but I want the public uh, to be clear. Um, we. Uh, Dallas County uh, and everyone else worked on this, the, the unified hospital system response uh, does want the resource source. I believe our team was uh, out there with uh, the Navy and others for three or four hours today uh, working on uh, how that would be set up. And my team is working on uh, a, an emergency item that's been on our commissioner's court uh, agenda since Friday. Um, for uh, the wraparound services that the county's required to pay for, uh, for that uh, the COVID step down unit. So, um, and uh, because that has popped up, also the uh, head of the unified response uh, is here as well. Now, do we have any questions from anyone? So, where does this information or the mismatch of information come from? You're saying that what's in the letter is essentially untrue? Yes, it is essentially untrue. Um, and it's the extra confusing aspect of it is um, uh, I received a phone call uh, and a copy of a, of a voice. You know, the, one, let me back up. One of the hardest things in, a, in an emergency response is communication up and down the chain, right? Um, and so the way that we've always done in the past, the way it worked with uh, Rick Perry and still works with the people that are uh, in the government long term, is we just pick up the phone and call one another. And so I received a phone call today from Nim Kidd, who is the chief of the Texas Division on Emergency Management, uh, sharing with me um, kind of a telephone gossip tree of somebody's voicemail, asking me, I explained to him uh, the situation that we did want the asset, that at no time did we say we didn't want the asset. Um, and uh, I know the man who wrote this letter got that information because as Nim and I finished our conversation, he said, oh, that's the governor's chief of staff on the other line. I'll have to call you back. Um, and then the media got this letter, which then I got a copy of this letter. So who knows? Um, we certainly will be happy to write back a letter uh, reiterating what everyone here who's actually working on the response knows, which is we are working hard to stand up that asset. And so then that would then, you would hope, satisfy this Five p.m. deadline by uh, tomorrow. That he actually. Well, I don't think I don't think it'll take people till five p.m. Uh, tomorrow to uh, stick a pin in this rumor. Um, and you know what I would say to uh, you know the governor's chief of staff is I've got the same cell phone number that I did uh, when Rick Perry was the governor, and um, you know I'd just encourage you to pick up the phone and use it. Did you have a conversation with Major General Mike Stone? There, there was a voicemail that was sent to us, Major General Mike Stone, indicating he spoke with you, and he was the one who claims uh, Judge Jenkins did not want this resource. Yeah, uh, uh, General Redstone is a good man. I don't believe he's the person. That, the only conversation was, was, read, uh, was General Stone on our call? I uh, think he may have. He, he may have there. Okay, so uh, he wasn't the one speaking. Uh, but uh, we did have a call with them, and I'll tell you about that call. Uh, in that call, at their request, they had a call with me. 
they had some need to move some uh, some contingent of people uh, to help in Louisiana um, if we would not have patients in the facility on Monday, well, which is tomorrow. I mean, and well, currently we have about a 50 percent occupancy uh, at our hospital system, and so we're not going to just put people in there for the purpose of, of showing the media that you know that it's being used. Um, it's, it, it is to be used uh, as a COVID step-down unit when there's hospital capacity issues, probably in a week or two, um, so that uh, you know we free up bed space for people who need ventilators and those sort of things. Um, so uh, I was on the call. Uh, Peter, who's leading the Unified Health System response, was on the call, some other hospital people. Um, and they explained to us that uh, if we didn't need uh, some of the doctors and nurses on Monday, they wanted to send them somewhere else. I said, we don't, you know, we want to be good to everyone. You know, we want to help sick people wherever we can, but we don't want to lose the asset. Uh, the general who, uh, not General Stone, but whoever it was that is actually the, the Navy guy that is providing the resource, I believe General Stone's with the National Guard, um, I said, you are our last customer and most important customer, and we will uh, uh, service that facility. Uh, and we're not moving our command staff, and we're not moving our headquarters. Um, we're uh, moving uh, a few assets. Um, if, if you're not going to have patients in there on Monday uh, to help in uh, New Orleans. Um, we thank them for the call, and uh, Peter can tell you more about you know, that, that's really my entire involvement. Yeah, I've had two conversations if General Stone was on the second one. The first conversation was his predecessor, who's a friend of mine, who we went through things together. I called him on the phone and uh, um, said I, I probably should get to know, um, you know uh, these folks. They hadn't reached out to me. and uh, So he shared me their cell phone. I called General Stone. And, and uh, you know, just made his acquaintance, and we'd be working together. I appreciated his help. Uh, that's one call. That was probably a week and a half ago, something like that, a week ago. Uh, and then if he's on this call, this this about ten minute call that took place, where at no time did we tell them take the assets from Dallas uh, and don't have them here when we need them. Uh, and Peter can tell you more about that and what we're doing on that. Uh, you want to do that now? Well, it, so oh, essentially, ahead. this was it, potentially now just a public miscommunication where you said we just don't need them tomorrow. We, we may need them in a week or two at the convention center, but right now, with the hospital capacity where it is, we don't need the convention center just yet, but we want that resource. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question was, uh, uh, was this some sort of a miscommunication, and um, did we do we want the resource, and um, whether it was you know it must have been a miscommunication, although it's hard for me to understand how it happened since I explained it on the phone to the chief of emergency management, who explained it to the person who wrote the letter, who then wrote a letter sent it to you, I got it from you, and then I got it uh, on my on my email. I don't know how that happened, but what I'm telling you is, uh, we need that asset. We need that asset when we need it. We don't need to send people from a state-of-the-art hospital to um, a convention center while we have 50% capacity. But unfortunately, the way that uh, these surges work, uh, in a week or two, we may not have bed space in our hospitals. Okay? And Peter can fill you in more on that. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Has Mayor Johnson said anything about this? Because I know he was named in the letter. Um, did he reach out to you about the letter at all? He has not, uh, not reached out to me, but um, I believe, was John Fortune on our call? I don't know. Uh, uh, he may have been. We've had a number at, of at least, so. at least uh, the emergency manager for uh, the city of Dallas uh, was on the call, uh, this 10-minute call that is the genesis of of the voicemail that led to this silly letter. Um, so, um, yeah, the city city was there on the call too. No, I haven't talked to the mayor. He hadn't uh, reached out to me or texted me or anything. 
the, the mayor just tweeted about 20 minutes ago saying, I share Governor Abbott's concern, and I was stunned and deeply disappointed to hear about Dallas County's position on the pop-up hospital at the city's K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center. Yeah. So you were saying his staff was on the call, and... Uh, well, uh, his staff was, uh, so the question is, um, someone is asking, uh, or I'm being asked by Alex, uh, that the, uh, I guess it would be the mayor, um, is, uh, is tweeting apparently something that he's, he's uh, stunned by um, our decision. And again, I would just encourage everyone, I have the same cell phone, um, our staffs, you know, and if you can't get me, i got the same staff as I've had for the last nine years. Uh, so check with us. Um, but um, ag again, there was city staff on this call where we made it very clear that we want the sad set. Uh, that was the at least, uh, and probably more, but at least Rocky Vaz, the city's emergency manager. So I think what's happened is um, the uh, governor's folks sent the letter, the mayor jumped to the conclusion that it must be true, put some things out on Twitter. You know, all of this was timed to be right before our press conference. So, you know, re read between the lines, you can figure out this deal. So um, what is your message to Dallas County, should they be concerned that once or if hospitals reach capacity that this um, Hutchinson Center will not be available to them if needed? Or what's your message to, to the people? No, you should not worry about this. Uh, I have uh, the, the, the Navy officer overseeing this whole thing's word that when we, when we need it, it will be there. And we are, are working uh, day in and day out to make sure it's ready. And I'm taking a, a, um, a request in front of the commissioner's court to fund the wraparound services that that, that may be awesome, or that, that federally supported uh, facility will need. Okay, so you shouldn't worry about that um, at all. Have okay. you guys um, tried to test everybody at these assisted care facilities? Is it something that's going to become a priority to test those to those people before others? Maybe? Sure. So the question is about testing at assisted uh, care facilities and long-term care facilities. Uh, currently, uh, anyone uh, can get a, a test through their medical provider, uh, if they, but those tests can take 10 days or something to get a, a, an answer back. Um, and I, so I shouldn't say anyone. Anyone can request one, but some, you know, not everyone's having luck getting them. Uh, what we're doing is if you're in a long-term care facility and you're asymptomatic and you're not right in that zone of uh, where we need to test you for a public health reason right around the, uh, the patient that got sick first, um, then we're not using our fast turnaround one-day test of which we are having to basically create here at the county and which we only have a few dozen of a day. However, if you have a loved one in the nursing home and you, or the psychiatric hospital, and you have a mechanism by which you could take them home, then we will use one of those, uh, those uh, precious tests that you only have a few dozen of to clear them so they can go back uh, to your home. And because those tests are not 100% accurate, if you take them back to your home, then you would be quarantined uh, for the two weeks um, as if they were, uh, were a positive. Um, because of their, everybody in a nursing home has what we call significant contact. Does that help? Does that answer that? Okay. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Can we just get an update on the hospital bed space that's available as of today? Who knows that? You know well, that? Let me comment on that. Yeah. Um, let me, before I comment on that as well, too, if I can just wrap up this issue that the judge mentioned about the Federal Medical Station. So uh, it is a joint effort. It's a joint effort with the federal government, the state of Texas, uh, Dallas County, City of Dallas, and uh, many other players. I actually spent several hours there today uh, and during this week as well, too. Uh, the first phase of this was actually getting the materials unpacked, getting it set up, which it has been. It's 240 beds. Uh, we were meeting today with uh, representatives from Department of Health and Human Services, from FEMA, from the state of Texas. Uh, as uh, the judge mentioned, the, uh, the Navy uh, contingent of uh, medical uh, personnel who have been sent to assist in this, 
individuals from the Army uh, to assist with this. Um, so it's a, it's a whole team effort, and we're, we're all moving forward together on this. So um, the confusion on this is unfortunate because we are all moving together. The county is committed to uh, having this as a resource. And as the judge said, this is a resource that will be utilized when it is necessary. The idea is that this is going to be a step-down unit uh, after individuals can be discharged from a hospital, uh, but they, for some reason, cannot go back to their home may not be able to go back to the facility where they were prior to being in the hospital. That's the, the use of that, uh, that facility. But the primary place of treatment of patients hopefully will still be in the hospitals, particularly those who have particularly uh, significant uh, symptoms and, uh, and needs uh, when they uh, get the coronavirus. So that's where we're moving forward, the judge said uh, he hopes to bring something. The budget people have been working this weekend uh, to the commissioner's court on uh, Tuesday so that the, uh, the uh, parts that the ca county is responsible for uh, can be funded. Um, on bed utilization, it, I, I should say it does, you know, goes up and down and, and, ac and across the board number is not necessarily accurate because some uh, hospitals uh, have, have greater uh, utilization and a greater patient census right now than others, but what we're not hearing right now is that there is not a, uh, uh, a, 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 um, a press or a, a for the ICU beds or other hospital beds right now. But we are monitoring with the DFW Hospital Council uh, and the RAC uh, utilization. All of the hospitals have been sharing their data on that so that everybody knows on a real-time basis where there are available beds and where there is available ICU capacity and ventilator capacity. That probably uh, uh, wraps us up. The la last thing I would just say to people is um, for you, uh, and r really for us too, we've got longer term strategic plans, but take this thing one day at a time so it's not overwhelming. Step back from your leadership role as a mom, as a, as a uh, uh, person at your job, and let somebody else do that for just a little bit so you can recharge. You can't help everyone, but you can help someone. So when you can, I help that person. And the last thing that I would say is please practice gratitude. I am so thankful every day for our healthcare heroes, our first responders, our grocery store workers, uh, the, the essential business employees. You know, I'm thankful for my great executive team for, for uh, Dr. Huang and Peter Bonowitz um, and everyone who works there. And I'm thankful uh, that um, while I'm sequestered in my home, at least I get to see my family, through, at least from the other room, right? Um, so find something to be thankful for because gratitude can push out despair. Um, we're all in this together. We will get uh, through this. And, you know, I thank you and please consider uh, giving to the need, uh, need at Neighbor versus Neighbor, our virtual food bank, benefiting the North Texas Food Bank. Good night and God bless you all. That's yours. Joshua, have you had a conversation with Greg Abbott? Have you spoken on the phone with him? I just respectfully, we're seeing all these tweets and, and leadership tweeting, but are, have you talked to the governor personally since this pandemic began, or when was the last time you spoke? So I did speak to the governor uh, on a, a conference call with other leaders, uh, imploring him to uh, do uh, safer at home. Uh, probably two weeks before he did that, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It's different, certainly. Uh, and the question was, have I spoken to the governor? It is different than it was with Rick Perry, uh, where during Ebola we might talk at least once a day, um, but it is different. Um, and I, you know, I don't believe any my, unless we got it in the last couple of hours. Uh, I don't even have his email. Uh, it's like to send him an email. You got to send emails through something called uh, like local suggestions or something at COVID or something. Um, so, so that's something that could be improved on. Have you had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the governor since the pandemic began? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, and I'd love to have one. So, governor, if you're watching the press conference, um, you know, please give me a call. I don't have your number, but you've got mine. Thank you.
please. Yeah, seriously.